D.C. is a place where history is made. And God bless the United States of America. There's power. On my orders, coalition forces have begun striking selected targets. And money. Three of the top five richest counties in America are in the suburbs of D.C. If you're looking to get rich, there are a number of ways that you could do it. You could create a successful business, invest in a successful business, commit a crime, or you could become a politician. In the United States, money and politics are intrinsically tied together. Now, don't get me wrong, most of the wealth that politicians in the US have today is amassed through legal means. I'm talking book deals, speeches, appearances, interviews, or using their public image to help market successful products. But there have been cases of insider trading within the ranks of Congress. Doing so is illegal, but only since 2012, when the Stock Act was first enacted to halt the practice. President Obama signing a bipartisan law Congress passed swiftly and overwhelmingly to make sure there's no insider trading in Congress. Since that act was passed, there haven't been any convictions of insider trading for U.S. politicians. But there have been some scandals. <gasps> One scandal in particular I've been following quite closely, as it happened just earlier this year. At the start of the coronavirus pandemic, several members of Congress made some incredibly well-timed trades just before the stock market was ready to tank due to widespread shutdowns. The trades these individuals made have come under incredible scrutiny. But before I get ahead of myself, let's meet our players, the individuals at the center of this scandal. And shortly after that tweet that I just noted, you sold over a million dollars in stocks in your own personal portfolio before the market went down. Were you trading on inside information about what was coming? First, we have Kelly Leffler, a Republican congresswoman from Georgia. Kelly's total net worth is estimated to be a whopping $500 million. Now, most of this wealth she amassed during her time in the business world. She worked for some pretty major labels, such as Citibank, Intercontinental Exchange, and BACT, where she held the position as CEO before she left for Congress in 2019. She was appointed to Congress by Georgia Governor Brian Kemp after another Republican senator resigned due to health reasons. She's also married to the CEO of Intercontinental Exchange, and he's also the chairman of the New York Stock Exchange, Jeffrey Sprecher. So you can probably tell why this power couple is absolutely loaded. But Kelly's actions as Congresswoman might not be all that noble. Over the last five years, like many members of the Senate, I have an outside uh, professional that manages my uh, personal finances. I'm not involved in the day to day. This is not just about Senator Perdue's personal misconduct and is lying about his financial dealings. It's about the fact that he's been holding up relief for the very people he serves while enriching himself in office. Next up, we have David Perdue, a Republican congressman also from Georgia. David's net worth is estimated at nearly $15 million. And similarly to Kelly, his net worth was achieved in the business world through his time in management consulting. David has held senior positions at Reebok, Pillotex, and Dollar General, where he was actually the CEO. And California Senator Dianne Feinstein also sold stocks. On Twitter this morning, Feinstein said the stocks belonged to her husband, who sold shares of a cancer therapy company. She also says her assets are in a blind trust. Dianne Feinstein is next on our list of senators to watch. She's a Democrat from California and one of the wealthiest senators currently in office, with a net worth of $58.5 million. Most of her net worth is associated with one incredibly valuable asset, an investment in Carlton Hotel Properties, which owns the Carlton Hotel in San Francisco. She's also married to a successful investment banker named Richard Bloom. The chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee temporarily stepping aside from his post as the feds investigate whether he used inside information to sell stocks and save big money before the pandemic tanked the market. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, we have Richard Burr, Republican senator from North Carolina and head of the Senate Intelligence Committee. As a congressman with an incredibly important role, Burr should be held to an even higher scrutiny than the rest. Burr's net worth is estimated to be around $7 million. Unlike the others in this list, Burr's fortune was generated through humble means. 
He served as a sales manager for a lawn equipment company for 17 years before he was elected to the House of Representatives. After serving several terms there, he was elected to the Senate in 2004, where he has served ever since. Burr's involvement in this scandal is perhaps the most interesting of the bunch. He's going to be front and center of our probe into political corruption. So let's look at a timeline of events. On January 23rd, the Senate Health Committee and the Senate Foreign Relations Committee released the following public statement. The novel coronavirus is an emerging public health threat. Senators will have the opportunity to hear directly from senior government health officials regarding what we know about the virus so far and how our country is prepared to respond as the situation develops. Now, I want you to remember this statement because it's important. On January 24th, those two Senate committees held a meeting where they briefed senators about a new strain of coronavirus that was affecting areas of Asia. There were growing concerns that it was going to find its way to America, or perhaps even already had. This was the first opportunity many senators had to hear about the growing threat of the virus. Immediately following the meeting, Kelly Leffler organized some pretty high trades with her husband Jeffrey. In total, they amounted to somewhere between $1,275,000 and $3,100,000. They also purchased some stock in a company called Citrix. You maybe have never heard of Citrix, but it's a technology company. The homepage of their website has a big header slapped on it. Create a work from anywhere experience that actually works. Now that we're about nine months into the pandemic, the concept of work from home is pretty well known to us. For many people, it's been their entire world during this time. Oh no, Eric, I think your computer is freezing up again. Oh no, really? Can you guys hear me? I just said it, 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 it. Eric, you'll just have to listen again, okay? Best you can. So let's start today, guys, by going over yesterday's grammar exam. But there weren't many people who would have called working from home ubiquitous. Now, don't get me wrong, it's not like Kelly and her husband invested in some no-name company for pennies. On January 24th, a single stock of Citrix was $124 a piece. But it certainly is a little suspicious that immediately following a security briefing about how the virus was going to affect Americans, Kelly had the foresight to purchase stock in a company whose product is work from home solutions. This turned out to be a pretty smart trade too, as the stock steadily rose during the start of the pandemic, and SEC filings show that Leffler ended up selling the stock on April 7th at $145. Remember David Perdue? Well, he made some interesting trades on January 24th following the Senate briefing as well, particularly in a company called DuPont. What does DuPont do? Well, they make a product that was going to become pretty valuable during the pandemic, something that was going to soon be in very short supply, personal protective equipment, or PPE for short. Now, unfortunately for David, his trades didn't turn out so well. The market can be tricky to time, and even companies whose products are in high demand were not immune to the market crash that occurred in March. World, the worst sell-off on Wall Street since the financial crisis in 2008. Growing fears the virus could tip economies into recession, so we want to be... This morning, stocks in the midst of their worst week since the financial crisis. The Dow plunging more than 3,200 points in just four days. After hitting record highs just last week, stocks are now down nearly 11%. DuPont stock fell from $59 when David purchased it to a low point of $28 on March 23rd. It's been steadily rising since then, and SEC filings show that David has sold some stock along the way though it's unclear how much he still owns today. The stock recently was sitting at $81. Dianne Feinstein's husband made a very interesting trade in January as well. He sold millions of shares of a biotech company called Allergene Therapeutics, a gene engineering company. While the trades were technically under her husband's name, the trades of spouses also come under scrutiny when being looked at by the SEC, as it is fairly conceivable that the two share information as a married couple. On February 7th, Richard Burr, along with fellow Senator Lamar Alexander, published an opinion piece on Fox News that was meant to quell the nerves of the United States citizens. In the editorial, Burr and Alexander highlight the preparations that the United States has taken to protect Americans. 
The editorial includes statements such as, Thankfully, the United States today is better prepared than ever before to face emerging public health threats, like the coronavirus, in large part due to the work of the Senate Health Committee, Congress, and the Trump administration. In general, the editorial projects confidence in America's readiness to take on the coronavirus, which was not exactly accurate. But to be clear, in no way did Burr outright lie to Americans in the article. In fact, the opening line is, Americans are rightfully concerned about the coronavirus. There are 12 confirmed cases of this new infectious disease in the United States. I think it's important for you to read the editorial for yourself, so I've included a link to it in the description. Behind closed doors, however, Burr didn't really seem to be projecting the same amount of confidence in the United States. On February 13th, Burr sold $1.7 million worth of stock, including stock in hotel chains Wyndham and Extended Stay America. It's no secret that a hotel's business is largely determined by the willingness and ability for Americans to travel. To me, this trade is a little aggressive for someone who thinks the situation is under control. On February 27th, Burr attended a meeting organized by the Tar Heel Circle at a social club called the Capitol Hill Club. The Tar Heel Circle is a group of individuals associated with businesses in North Carolina, and its biggest purpose is to connect those individuals with important people in Washington, D.C. NPR reports that in attendance at the meeting with Burr were dozens of people who had donated more than $100,000 to Burr's re-election campaign in 2015 and 2016. To this small group of insiders, Burr shared key details about what the government knew about coronavirus, such as, There's one thing I can tell you about this. It is much more aggressive in its transmission than anything we have seen in recent history. It is probably more akin to the 1918 pandemic. That's right, Burr said that. The previous transcript was apparently obtained by NPR through a secret recording. Additionally, he told those insiders about how the military hospitals were set to be mobilized in New York and other areas, which was, at the time, not public information. The news stories about this meeting and his stock transactions apparently shook Burr quite deeply as he started releasing public statements denying the accusations that he used or shared non-public information, both of which are crimes. He was so confident that he was innocent that he requested that the Senate Ethics Committee investigate his actions on March 20th. By March 30th, the Department of Justice had officially started investigating him and three other senators, Kelly Loeffler, Jim Inhofe, and Dianne Feinstein. Curiously, David Perdue was not listed as being under investigation. The situation reached its head when FBI agents confiscated Burr's cell phone and issued a warrant to search his iCloud account. Uh, the fact that this has now escalated, apparently, into a criminal investigation, which would have to be the case in order for the FBI to get a warrant to, uh, to seize his phone, uh, that, that shows that, that clearly DOJ is now involved in looking into this, which takes it to the next level. This was a huge PR disaster for Burr, as it signaled that his actions could potentially have been illegal. In response, he stepped down as the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee. On May 26, the Department of Justice signaled that it would end its probe into Leffler, Inhofe, and Feinstein. It didn't offer any information about how the investigation proceeded or the reasons that it was dropped. The three senators rallied around the news with fresh statements reiterating their innocence. But the story isn't over for Richard Burr. During the investigation, the FBI found other incriminating transactions made by Burr way back in 2018. The investigation into Burr is still ongoing. So what about Kelly Leffler and the other senators? Why didn't they get served by the state? There are a bunch of hypotheses about why nothing happened to these senators including that the Department of Justice is playing partisan politics and choosing not to indict certain individuals because of their political affiliations. I have a different theory. The whole basis for insider trading is that it has to come from information that is not publicly available. Luckily for these senators, they all had a very convincing piece of evidence, the publicly released announcement by the Senate Health Committee on January 23rd. 
The case could easily be made that all of the senators who sold stock during that time were operating solely on the publicly released information about the emerging public health threat. Unfortunately, we'll never know what actually happened in the Department of Justice. But if you think they got away with it and are angry about it, here's one piece of consolation. Kelly Leffler was up for re-election in the Georgia runoffs that happened earlier this month. She lost. Hey guys, thank you for sticking till the end. We hope you enjoyed the video. We'll keep making these mini documentaries every week as long as you smash the like and subscribe buttons. Also, leave your thoughts in the comments. If you have any particular video you'd like to see, leave it also in the comments.